Finally, one point only for the sake of connecting between this and another very curious and important topic. Very interesting one. An, an indirect one that sometimes when you tend to think about the authenticity of the Quran, you keep focusing in depth on preservation and by memory, by writing, codices and so on. But there is something very simple and very logical. Many of you are familiar with the literature that came up in recent times about the Quran, the Ajaz, the miracle of the Quran, not from the standpoint of historical or archaeological argument, but from purely scientific, decisive, known science, not scientific theories, established facts of science. And you're lucky here in Toronto that you have, of course, Dr. Keith Moore, and some of you must have seen his lectures about the amazing, precise expression in the Quran about human embryology, even genetics, a science that developed only in recent decades that shows that indeed the Quran could have not been written by human. My question here is this, aside from the argument on the issue that we didn't deal with today, the authority of the Quran, the evidence that it is impossible that Prophet Muhammad wrote that or any human because these are scientific inv inventions that we only learned recently. Aside from that line of argument, my question is very simple. If indeed there was the slightest tampering in the words of the Quran, how come these amazing discoveries are known today? In other words, if somebody tampered with the Quran, and in the ayat in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah 23, that deals with the embryonic stages, or ayat that gives a clear indication about genetics, that it is the sperm of the man that determine the uh, sex of the fetus, not the, the egg, which is established in genetics now. If there was the slightest uh, tampering, would we have that precise expression in the Quran today? So that could be another issue that you can go on and research and relate it actually to the issue of authenticity. In conclusion, I must apologize to you that in a way before I gave that talk, I asked my brothers for some advice. I said if the kind of audience we have today is the kind of audience that is looking mainly for uh, general inspirational talk, no problem. I could have talked about Salah, and we have some slides also about some aspect of Salah. If, however, uh, there is uh, a high degree of seriousness and interest, then perhaps we can try to touch on a topic as complex and as deep as this topic. And the advice I got that, alhamdulillah, the audience is very receptive and very uh, attentive. And I could testify that I hardly heard anyone really snoring or I might have seen a couple of cases of people getting a little bit astounded by the uh, information. But Alhamdulillah, I am grateful to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala that you were able to go through this very uh, laborious uh, type of presentation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it useful. And if some of you at least felt it is too dry, I seek only your forgiveness for one reason that uh, in recent decades, and especially in the last few years, with the constant attempt to destroy Islam and Muslims, uh, we find various means of destruction. There is first the destruction of Muslims physically through genocide, as we have seen in occupied Palestine, and in Bosnia, in uh, India, in Kashmir, other place in Cambodia, and, um, and, so, and uh, uh, Burma, former Burma, uh, we see one attempt to destroy Muslim or liquidate them physically. But what is even more dangerous and serious and very relevant to Muslims living in the West here that I can see because I'm interested in that area. I see in literature, in the uh, kind of speakers that are going around the country giving lectures to churches and other places in talk shows, so books, uh, talks, videos, that there is an attempt also to destroy Islam by dis attacking the credibility of its prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They realize that Muslims are awfully lucky by having a book which is both authoritative and authentic that there was no tempering, which is unparalleled in human history or any religious faith. So they want to attack both the authority and authenticity of the Quran 
And if I had time, I could have given you more examples of the so-called errors of science in the Quran, errors of grammar in the Quran. There are lots of all kind of uh, uh, unjustified and erroneous critiques, unobjective. It appears objective, but it's really unscientific and unobjective attacks on the authority and authenticity uh, of the Quran and through attacking its own teaching that it's old fashioned or cruel or whatever. Uh, so uh, I believe that while the topic I admit is even less interesting for some or less or more dry than dealing, for example, with the authority of the Quran. How do we know it is the word of Allah, which is still uh, an elaborate topic, but perhaps a little bit more uh, uh, easy to follow. I believe, however, that it might be useful uh, for some at least and might at least generate some interest on the part of some of you. That's why I'd like to conclude by uh, mentioning some of the reflections. I did mention, but that should be at the last, the very end of the list. But for something that might be readily available is album seven, six and seven actually of the Islamic teaching series, where you have uh, a total of 32 hours of taping all about the Quran. The first part is on uh, authority. The other one is authenticity and sciences. But uh, for those who read Arabic, uh, the uh, best source, in my judgment, contemporary source, in terms of scholarship and response to some of the Orientalist claims, is the one written by the, another martyr, a Sheikh, uh, Dr. Muhammad uh, uh, Subh Salih. Dr. Subh Salih is a great Lebanese scholar who wrote two important volumes. One is called Mabahith fi Ulum al Quran. Mabahith is not like some people in Egypt believe, like a security service. Mabahith means uh, research or areas of research pertaining to the sciences of the Quran. And another one is another Mabahith in the sciences of Hadith. This is an excellent source uh, on the topic. Um, in terms of um, relatively recent ones, the book by Az Zurqani, it's called. Uh, uh, Ajaz al-Qur'an, if I remember the title correct, is a very important source on that. Among the earliest writings which has been quoted frequently by many writers is uh, Jalal al-Suyuti, again, on Ulum al-Qur'an, sciences of the Qur'an. I'm not trying to say that these are the only ones, at least these are ones that I'm familiar with that really have great importance and uh, wealth of information. Uh, for those who uh, do not read Arabic, it is unfortunate that you don't have as many translated because, like I said, the topic is very hard itself. Uh, the, among Muslim as public, very few are aware of many of those aspects. And among people even who specialize or study in that area, there are not too many because of the difficulty of the topic itself and some technical elements involved. However, a simplified and reasonable source is written by a German Muslim who accepted Islam. Um, it's called Ulum al-Qur'an. Ulum al-Qur'an. Uh, Subhanallah, I'm becoming old, forgetting names. His name is uh, Ahmed von Denfer, exactly. Den D-E-N, Denfer, von Denfer, V-O-N, and the last name Denfer, D-E-N, double F, uh, E-R. That's a good uh, book also on the subject. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may enable me sometimes just to uh, not as a alim, but as a student to compile uh, some of this information, which is already actually on the tapes, but to put it also in some uh, uh, written form. So my apology again, and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make some benefit of this extremely lengthy presentation. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.